Welcome back. We're at lecture 36. We should finish up uh, the supplement today. So um, I don't know if you want to continue to carry this around, whether you have this or the copy that I made, but we'll be back in the textbook tomorrow in Chapter 8. <laughs> so we should finish these today. Uh, remind me when we start, we're going to do a couple of kind of sample problems or example problems that we kind of put a clock on how long it takes us to do that problem. That'll give me a clue about do I include one of these all the way through on the test or, you know, if it takes us 27 minutes to do one problem, it probably is not a test-worthy kind of problem. And um, just remind me when we start that we kind of put a stopwatch on it and see how long it takes us. Uh, we were in the middle of a problem, but it was a question that Nicole asked yesterday. Um, she and I worked after class and got that figured out. Is there anybody that needed to go beyond where we were in that problem? We had the first particular solution, which was linear, negative a half x minus a fourth, I think, was the right, was the way that went, and then we were about to embark on the particular solution for sine of 2x or something like that. Procedure is kind of the same. Um, as we found out yesterday, it's very easy to, uh, when you're doubling or tripling equations and putting an equation with C1 and C2 together with another equation with C1 and C2 to make some arithmetic errors. So you do have to to be kind of careful when you're trying to solve after you've found the homogeneous solution, the first particular solution, the second particular solution, and then you go back to the initial conditions uh, and try to solve for C1 and C2. It can be a little bit cumbersome arithmetically. Anybody need to see that second part of the particular solution? All right, well, let's go to electric circuits. As we encountered before, uh, some first order linear equations with uh, trying to model electric circuits. Uh, I confess to you that I'm not an expert by any means. Um, I can, once we get it kind of translated from the electric circuit problem to the second order differential equation problem, I feel myself uh, giving a sigh of relief that we now have it into a form that I feel comfortable with. So it's a matter of kind of translating what Kirchhoff's voltage drops law says, add them up, set them equal to the electromotive force or the voltage that's being supplied, and then, as I said before, breathe a sigh of relief, and then we've got it in a form that we have already worked with, so it should be the same thing we've been doing. So we're going to have these kind of things on our electric circuit. This, these things right here are the um, voltage drops across this particular circuit, and we will take the sum of the voltage drops and set them equal to the basically the electromotive force, whatever it is, the voltage, whatever it is in the problem. So we're going to have things such as uh, resistors. The unit will be in ohms. Looks like a capital omega. Uh, we'll have an inductor. The unit will be in Henry's. We'll have a capacitor. The unit will be in Faraday's. You can probably kind of assign some of this to who did some research and came up with a lot of this stuff in electricity. The charge, in fact, we want a second order differential equation in terms of charge, will be Q. We don't have that here yet. We have Q in this term. Uh, we don't have Q in this term. And we don't have Q in this term. So we're going to have to kind of doctor it up slightly from the kind of taking the voltage drops across this particular circuit and get it in terms of Q, which is the charge. So the charge is Q, and the current is I. So when you see I, it's a current. Now, 
Now, how are current and charge related? Current is derivative of Q with respect to T. And that gets us from what appears to be kind of a first order uh, differential equation now to a second order. So these are the three things we want to deal with in this particular circuit. We want to add them up. There's a reason why this term was written first. Because the derivative of I with respect to T, well, I itself is the current. It's already the derivative of Q, the charge, with respect to T. So if I is already a first derivative, what's the derivative of this first derivative? That's the second derivative of Q. So dI over dt, since I is already dQ over dt, derivative of I would be second derivative of Q with respect to t. I, which is right there, is a first derivative. It is derivative of Q with respect to t. And then if you'll factor out this division by C, bring it out in front as 1 over C, then that will be our Q. So here's our second derivative of Q term. Here's our first derivative of Q term. And here's our Q term itself. So this is what our equation is going to look like. Now, once we get to that, it's the same old stuff that we've been doing in 7.8 and 7.9 thus far. But we have a second order linear differential equation in terms of Q, which is charge. So I'm sure that seems a lot more comfortable to a lot of you in here than it does to me. But I am relieved when we get everything plugged in and we get to this point in an electric circuit problem. So this thing on the right is what they refer to as the electromotive force battery generator, whatever it happens to be, it goes on the right side. Then we no longer have a homogeneous differential equation. We have a non-homogeneous differential equation. So let's look at an example from the supplement and another example that um, is one of the web assigned problems. I think it's web assigned problem five from this section. And uh, I kind of want to see how long it takes us to get through all this with the initial conditions as well as see what these problems are like. Once you get them set up, they're not that different from what we've already done. This example from the supplement, the um, R value is 40 ohms. The um, L value, let me go ahead and put the symbolism here, is 1. That makes our lead coefficient 1, which is kind of helpful on this problem. And our C value is 16 times 10 to the negative fourth. Now, it's not Faraday's. It's Farad's, Farad's, right? But it, that comes from Faraday. And the E of T, which is going to be out there on the right side, the so-called electromotive force is that. So you're going to be supplied these things if we put them in the right places as coefficients in the equation, then we're in business. We can go from there. On this example problem, the initial charge is zero. Charge is Q, so the Q of 0, we're going to have an equation Q of T when we're done. So the Q of 0 is 0. The initial current is also 0. So either write it that way or the Q prime of 0 is 0. Same thing. So the Q of 0 is 0, the Q prime of zero is zero. Well, those will be at the end of the problem. We do have one additional thing in this problem that will analyze what happens as T approaches infinity. So we get a so-called steady state 
what happens way out to the right as T approaches zero, you'll see one of the terms kind of eventually disappear. All right, so our equation is L1, second derivative of Q with respect to T. That worked out nicely. Uh, what's our next one? What's our first derivative? What's our um, Q prime or DQ? 40? DQ over DD. Somebody start a watch here so we can kind of keep track now that we know the numbers, how long a problem like this is going to take us. Uh, the last term is Q over C, or if you bring it out in front, it's 1 over C. So 16 times 10 to the negative fourth ought to be that. Does that seem odd on the right side that that's our so-called electromotive force? Is that, could that be? Nicole. I have a question about the left side. Can you, like for visual, whatever, can you just put Q double? Yes. I so will you don't on the have next. To write it like yes. That. Okay. Is that? I mean, does anything really kind of electrically look like that? Alternating currents. Alternating currents, right? Do in fact have equations that look like that. So we're going to our second example is just 12 volts, and we'll throw a 12 over there. But this is actually a, an alternating current, an oscillating current. All right, so 1, so we've got Q double prime. We've got 40 Q prime, 1 over 0 0.0016 is what, 625? Is that right? All right, there's my sigh of relief. I'm at a place where I feel real comfortable on this problem now because we're kind of putting the Henrys and the Farads and the Ohms behind us, and now we have a second order differential equation, non-homogeneous. What's the path from here? Right, homogeneous solution, so Q sub H. We've got an equation in terms of Q double prime, Q prime, and Q, so we'll solve it for a Q of T. So our homogeneous solution What's the uh, characteristic equation look like? All right, factors? Probably not. So negative b plus or minus b squared minus 4 times a times c. all over twice A. All right, what do we have under the radical there? 1600 minus Twenty six hundred? Twenty five hundred? So what do we have under there? Negative nine hundred? Square root of negative nine hundred. Thirty I? So what do we have? Negative twenty? plus or minus 15i. Does that look good? So our homogeneous solution, what's it look like? 2t. C 
cosine of 15 t. So that's going to be part of our answer. Second part, particular solution. It's going to be a joyful looking solution, isn't it? With 15 T's and now what? 10 T's? How are we going to generate a certain amount of, in this case, 100 cosine of 10 T's? Well, we don't know how many to start with, so it's just A. We don't know how many um, cosine of 10 t's to start with, right? And then B, sine of 10 t. So we need sines and cosines in the Q position so that we can generate cosines and sines in the Q prime position, and we can generate back to our original sines and cosines in the Q double prime. And we want the, what, sine of 10 t's to eventually drop out, right? We want to be left with 100 cosine of 10 t's. First derivative. Plus 10. B derivative again all right we plug those things in to the left side, and then we set it equal to 100 cosine of 10t. So for q double prime, anything ridiculously difficult to this point in time in the problem? Just kind of cumbersome and lengthy, right? Don't think anything's outrageously difficult. So there is Q double prime. We had that in there once. We have, what, 40 Q primes. And we have 625 of the original Q things. And when we do that with our particular solution, one of those, 40 of those, 625 of those, we should get 100 cosine of 10t. So what are the different kinds of terms that we're going to generate on the left side? Cosine of 10t's and... You can do this other ways. I'm just going to kind of gather up what we have. So let's take our Q double prime term, which we have one of. How many cosine of 10 t's? Negative 100 a minus 100 b of those. Is that correct? How many from the Q prime term? What is that? Negative 400? A of them and 400 B of these. And now the other one, what, 625 A of those and 625 B of those. So our 
coefficients for cosine of 10t, what is our kind of final coefficient there? 525a plus 400b equal to 100. Equals 100. Is that correct? Because that's how many we have over here. We have 100 of them. And our other coefficient is what? 525b minus 400a equals 0. Minus 100? No. 400a. That's our coefficient of sine. We don't have any sine of 10t's over here. So that must be 0. All right, any recommendations there to eliminate? Yeah, let's go substitution rather than work with those coefficients. So if we said from the second equation, 520, we're not going to get a very delightful answer on this. In fact, none of the answers are um, things that we would like to be working with, but it's kind of what we're handed. 525b equals 400a, divide by 400. So we can substitute that in for a in this equation. So 525a becomes 525 times. this might be time to switch to the calculator to get our A and B values. I don't know if I have these written down or not. I don't. So get coefficients of B, add those coefficients together. Anybody else? Zero nine two. Yeah. No, I don't remember that value, but that's possible that I don't remember that value. Okay, they didn't give them in decimals; they gave them in fractions with a denominator of six hundred ninety-seven. Okay, so we'll stick with decimals. Yeah, sixty-four over six ninety-seven. Decimals are fine, because that's kind of annoying at that point to try to get everything with the common denominator and go from there. All right, now we have B. We have an equation that interrelates A and B. So if we take 525 over 400 times B, that should give us A. 1205. Thank you. So there's A and B. So let's write our solution, and then we'll go to the initial conditions. So Q of T, what was the homogeneous part? So we add to that the particular solution, which is what? <coughs> what was A the coefficient of? Cosine 10t. Yeah. And B was the coefficient of sine of 10t. Everybody okay to that point? Where are we on the time, on the clock? 15 minutes? Okay. Now what do we have to do? We have initial conditions. So Q of 0, this ought to go pretty quick. 
So the initial charge is zero, so Q of zero is zero. So we get a zero on the left side. What do we get out here in front when T is zero? Okay, that's one. Cosine of 15, zero is cosine of zero, so that's one, just C1. This has sine of zero in it, so that's gone. 0 0.1205 cosine of zero, which would be, and this has sine of zero, which is gone, right? So that's not bad. C1 is negative, 0 0.1205. That'd be nice if the next one went that quickly. It won't, because it is what? First derivative? So it's Q prime of, where is the information? Q prime of zero is zero. So that's the other initial condition. So we need Q prime of T. That looks like fun. So where's our Q of T? It is the first piece, the homogeneous piece, is a product. So it is first times derivative of second. What's derivative of C1 cosine 15T? Okay. And derivative of C2 sine 15T? All right, so that is first times derivative of second. Now we need second times derivative of first. What's derivative of e to the negative 20 t? All right, so that's the only product rule we have. The rest are individual terms. What's the derivative of 0 0.1205 cosine 10t? Negative 1.205 sine 10t. And what's the derivative of 0 0.092 sine of 10t? Everybody feel reasonably confident with all those numbers and coefficients? So we're supposed to put in zero for every t, and it's supposed to kick out zero on the left side. So e to the negative 20 times zero is just one. So what do we get out of this one if t is zero? Zero out of that one, because it's sine of zero. 15c2 out of that one. Out in front of the next term, I've actually got it at the end, we're going to have a negative 20 times 1. Is that right? And then what for this one? C1. C1. And what for this one? Zero. Zero. This one has a sine of zero in it, so it's gone. This one has a cosine of zero, so that's 0.92. Okay, so we already have C1, right? What do we get for C1? Negative 0 0.1205. So take all the numerical stuff to the left side, keep all the C2 stuff on the right side, divide by the coefficient of C2. Negative 1.28. Got a couple of those. Positive. Positive. 
Well, we've got this was negative and this was also negative. So this was positive, but when we moved it over here, it became negative, right? And then we've got okay. a positive 0.92, which got moved to a negative. So we've got a negative divided by a positive, so it should be negative 0.22. Yeah. Repeating? Yeah. Which would be, what, two nights if we needed it? Okay. So let's write our final solution, what, 20 minutes later? <laughs> so Q of T equals E to the negative 20T C1 cosine 15T plus C2, what was C2? Negative 0.22 sine of 15 T plus 0.1205 cosine 10 T Yeah, let me see how those check out because some of those in the supplement here we're given as fractions. Our 10s and 15s look good. Um, what's negative 84 divided by 697? Negative 0.125. Okay. And what is negative 464 divided by 2091? Negative 0.22. Okay, so we're okay, because they gave exact fractions. We're okay with these decimals. All right, now I said we were going to do one more thing that we normally don't do at the end of this problem. Is That is, look at what happens as T approaches infinity with our final answer. So what, what happens to this kind of lengthy equation with these odd coefficients and all that's present as t approaches infinity. Can you tell? Do we kind of lose part of this equation? The first part. Why do we lose the first part? Because doesn't e to the negative 20t as t approaches infinity, this piece gets smaller and smaller and smaller? Right? Because it's 1 over e to the 20t, and if t gets larger, that denominator gets huge in a hurry. So this term right here goes to zero, which eliminates everything that it's multiplied by as t approaches infinity. So the steady state as t approaches infinity, q of t takes on that equation because the first part kind of eventually disappears for large values of t. All right, well, that tells me something, that 20 minutes on one problem, even though it's our first problem, is probably not uh, a fair test question. So what I could do, which um, I could have you do the homogeneous part, the particular part, on one problem similar to this, and possibly on another problem, give you those, give you some initial conditions that maybe are a little bit kinder than these decimal values, and have you take it from there to figure out the final result. I'll, I'll have to mess with that, but 20 minutes on one problem is probably too long. All right, second example. This is a web assigned problem, so you might want to jot down at least kind of the different stages that we get to. From the supplement, this is problem 12, but as far as web assign, this is your problem 5 on web assign. A series circuit contains a resistor with R equals 24 ohms, an inductor with L equals 2, 
Henry's and a capacitor with C equal 0 0.005 farads and a 12 volt battery so it's a little different on the right side. The initial charge is 0 0.001 and the initial current is zero. Find the charge and the current. By the way, I think we didn't completely finish that other problem because the directions said to find the charge and the current at time t. Now we finished with Q of t, which is the charge, right? What would we need to do with that Q of t to get the current? Take its derivative. So we had the answer. So we take its derivative and we have um, the other piece to the solution. All right, so let's fill in our numbers. Um, R is 24, L is 2, that's our lead coefficient. R is 20, no, 24. And C, which we really want 1 over C. One over that is 200. Now this is a little different because we just have 12 volts. So we're just going to put a 12 over there. Now the nice thing about the 12 over there is the particular solution. Because we have a constant, therefore what is our particular solution? It's a constant, some random constant, A, and it's going to make that piece really easy. So the particular solution of this will go real quickly. All right, so 2 Q double prime plus 24 Q prime plus, that was 200? Mm -hmm. Equals 12. So the homogeneous part, could reduce everything by 2, right? Anybody think of factors of 100 that are going to give us minus 12 in the, or plus 12 in the middle? I don't think we need to waste our time on that. There's probably a good reason of why we didn't need to waste our time on that. What's under the radical? What's 144 minus 400? Sixteen. So minus, so the square root of negative 256 is 16i. So we get negative 6 plus or minus 8i. Alpha is negative 6. Beta is 8. Sorry, that's not right. Yes. So what's our homogeneous solution look like? Okay, we look at the right side. What do we have to generate? We have to generate a constant. So we start with some generic constant. It's about as generic as you can get. Not really a lot of real interesting stuff here. The derivative, first derivative of the unknown 
constant is 0. The second derivative is also 0. So the left side of the equation is 2 q double prime plus 24 q prime plus 200 q So that works out nicely with the 12 volts on the right side of the equation. 200A equals 12. So what is A? So our final solution is the homogeneous part. I guess not final, but at least the two pieces thus far. Right? That's it. It's a constant, so we just kind of, it's not like it's a coefficient of anything. It's just some arbitrary constant. Um, let's see, this is problem 12 here. The initial charge. Q equals point zero zero one. Let's see what that tells us. So we're going to use our solution. So on the left side, we're going to get point zero zero 0.001. Everywhere we see a T on the right side, we're going to put in 0. So that is 1. That's going to be C1. That's going to be gone, right? And that's going to be plus point oh 0.06. So C1 is whatever that arithmetic gives. And our other information that's given, the initial current, which is derivative, so Q prime of zero is zero. So we need Q prime. So the first piece is a product, first times derivative of second. should be the derivative of the second. Does that look right? Plus second. Times derivative of first. And then the derivative of 0 0.06, the derivative of the constant, is zero. So left side, we're going to get 0. Right side, every time we see a t, we put in 0. So that's e to the 0, which is 1. Negative 8, c1, sine, that's 0. This is going to be, what, 8, c2? Does that look right? If t is 0. Here we've got negative 6, e to the 0, so that's just negative 6. Here we have C1, and this one is gone. We already know that C1 is that, so move that to the other side. Zero four four two five. Is that all right? So I think now we have a final answer. Q of T E to the negative six T C one.
cosine of 8t plus c2 sine of 8t plus our constant that we figured out earlier. That one was a little less time. Q of P was a little, quite a bit simpler. What was that, 10 minutes? Okay. So probably it's about a 15-minute problem, a normal problem that we go through again. All right, so that should finish us from this. You do have some web assigned problems uh, from this. There's one of them already done for you. We will continue back in the regular textbook starting tomorrow. Have a good afternoon.